Uh, people are serving in all kinds of places. We all go to work every day, and we have a community into which we go. And there, if we have a story to tell, we have the privilege of telling it. There are certain communities of people that are accessible only by certain people who happen to be in the community. So we have, for example, surgeons here. We have uh, people who work in industry. We have folks who are in various aspects of life. We have a number who are in the arts as well, in the Cleveland Orchestra, CIM students, and so on. And so we're very partial to people who are involved as missionaries in the arts. And uh, uh, two of my friends who are here this morning are just such missionaries, and, that, and I want them just to come and, and talk to me just for a moment, if they would, and just come and stand beside me. And uh, that way you can hear uh, from them whether they can make sense of the missionary calling that they've received. This is uh, uh, somebody that some of you will know. I, uh, you're <laughs> Alice Cooper and his wife, uh, Cheryl. Uh, there we go. And uh, they are uh, missionaries in a world of the arts. Hi, how are you? Yep. I have three simple questions for you, okay? Okay. The first one is, um, where and when did you meet? And Cheryl, was he Alice Cooper before you met him? Well, my name is Cheryl Cooper, and I've been married to my amazing husband for 43 years. <laughs> Which... I, I, I love it that, that, well, no, I don't love it. I regret that we are the anomaly and not the norm, especially in our business of rock and roll. But uh, you asked me how we met. Yeah, where and we, when? I met when I was 18 years old and auditioned for some rock concert. It was an open audition. They wanted trained ballerinas, which I am. And I went not knowing for what role I was going, but they said it was somebody named Alice Cooper. And I said, who's she? <laughs> I thought it was maybe some blonde female folk singer, and look what I got. <laughs> And I was selected for a role in the, the then 1975 production of Welcome to My Nightmare and uh, fell nightmare deeply in love. And the, the nightmare, nightmare came true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let me ask you, um, Alice, at what point in, in your life um, did sort of personal faith in Jesus get like, fastened in? You know, where, where would you say it became a living? reality well I my father was a pastor my grandfather was an evangelist Cheryl's father's a pastor uh, so we were PKs you know um, I grew up in the church so I always introduced myself as a prodigal son and my wife as some sort of angel and uh, you know I I grew up all my friends were church kids uh, Detroit, as, right? In, well in Detroit then in Phoenix Arizona where the band actually got together in high school and we went as far away away from the church as possible i was the poster boy for everything you shouldn't be alice cooper was like marilyn manson times 10. and of course I, you know I'm, I'm drinking with jim morrison every night and jimi hendrix and all those guys and uh in fact when i got to the golf course the other day i said i didn't know we were playing with paul mccartney <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> am i right <laughs> even the accent but but, uh, you know, uh, I, I went as far away as I could, and of course I became an alcoholic. I became a drug addict. Uh, Cheryl lived through that with me. And I got to a point where it was just over. I was never a drunk drunk. I was just on that golden buzz. So I didn't really understand that I had a problem. Um, as soon as it did become a problem, I went into the hospital. And when I came out, I was not a cured alcoholic, I was a healed alcoholic. And I make that very specific to people because, I mean, I was the classic alcoholic. Uh, alcohol was medicine to me, not, it wasn't just fun to drink, it was medicine. And when I came out, I went right to a bar and had a Coca-Cola because I knew it was going to be around alcohol all my life. And... I was waiting for the, cr the craving to come. It never came. It never came for 37 years. So I always tell people I'm a healed alcoholic. There were really some good prayers going out for me. And that's when Cheryl and I started realizing that we needed to back to church, get back involved, and uh, 
And that's when I was baptized and became a Christian uh, again. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, we could talk all morning, but we can't because I'm supposed to preach. But uh, um, <laughs> although they'd go, no, 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 keep talking. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the, the world in which you live, as I say, is a unique world. What, how, as folks think about you because they know you, how do, we, how do we pray for you at this stage in the game, given the, the platform that you've been given? Well, we, we have a thing called Solid Rock Foundation. No, it's not foundation, Solid Rock. And it's a, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, it's 30,000 square feet. Uh, any teenager can come in and learn any instrument, uh, dance, art, everything that they can't get in school anymore. A teenager's worst problem is too much time on their hands because the world has so much to offer out there that is so wrong. And it's a much more dangerous world for teenagers now. Uh, heroin is easier to get than beer. Uh, so we opened this place up and we get about 100 kids a day in there. We get gang related kids, we get rich kids, we get gay kids, we get, you know, every kind of teenager you can imagine. But they're in a place now, it's a Christian nonprofit that Jesus Christ is available to them. Mm -hmm. They used to think that was just a swear word, some of these kids. They're literally born into the gangs. So they're selling meth by the time they're 14 years old. And people say, well, yeah, well, we don't want our kids going there because there's kids selling meth. I said, well, where does your kid live on the east side? I said, well, where do, who do you think they're selling it to? The kids with the money. Right. So all kids are at risk. All teenagers are at risk, but we offer them this place to come to, give them an alternative, breaks the cycle, and, and they have Jesus Christ available to them. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to God be the glory. To God be the glory always, because what you see in us is an outward expression of an inward transformation. And uh, a lot of the kids who come to Solid Rock say, what's the catch? And we say the catch is you show up because as believers, whatever Jesus said he did, did you ever realize, whatever Jesus said he did, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He heals a blind man. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He feeds 5,000 people. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He calls Lazarus come forth. So ours is an outward expression of an inward transformation. It's great. Let's just pause and pray. Lord, how we thank you for your grace and goodness to us, uh, the way in which the configuration of those whom you've made your own is so diverse, is a testimony to your creative handiwork. Thank you uh, that uh, Alice and, and Cheryl would uh, be with us here today. We pray for them in the place that you've set them. We pray for the kids that are in that Solid Rock program. We pray for their testimony amongst so many who are known to us only uh, through magazines and at a distance, and yet to whom they have immediate and direct access. We pray that both by life and by lip, they may continue to commend the gospel. And we pray, too, that even tonight in Cleveland, as uh, they have the opportunity of their concert, that they might know that at least they've got a whole new company of people praying for them and uh, standing behind them and asking you to be to them as to us all that we need and all that we require. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, man. Thank and by the you. way, he's a little better than his handicap. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh,